Time the gentleman has expired. Gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Wyden. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Poucher, I'd like to ask you some questions about Quad Pharmaceuticals, uh, uh, the PAR uh, subsidiary. Now, how long have you been associated with the agency as an inspector? I've been an investigator for 12 years. And when uh, did you inspect Quad uh, Pharmaceuticals? December of 1988. And how did this assignment uh, come about? Our Detroit laboratory found a weight variation in one drug where we now know the batch that was sent to FDA for uh, testing was made in R&D rather than uh, made in production under good manufacturing practice control. What were the principal findings of your inspection? Um, threefold. First, that uh, quads and DAs did not actually or fully describe the nature of the batches that were manufactured and tested in support of those A and DAs. Uh, specifically, quad was providing batches that were made in its research and development facilities and they were describing them as production batches. Secondly, quads and DAs contained inaccurate statements regarding other matters as well. And thirdly, that key records were either missing, falsified, or in substantial disarray. Why is uh, batch information in the abbreviated new drug uh, applications important to the public and to the subcommittee? Well, generally, the uh, Food and Drug Administration requires that drug samples be tested for stability, potency, um, and other parameters for the drug. Um, as a practical matter, the FDA wants the tested material to be the same as what the consumer will actually buy. Um, so the production batches, in this case, are going to be desired. Um, the batch records should show exactly how each batch was manufactured. Um, because the method of manufacture is so critical, the batch records are the foundation uh, that support the drug that was produced. What did Quad end up giving to, uh, to the agency? Um, Quad usually provided batches made by the R&D personnel in R&D facilities. And what's the difference between R&D lots and, and the uh, production lots? Well, Quad's R&D lots are not made in accordance with good manufacturing practice regulations. They do not comply with record keeping requirements and they are not made either by the people or on the equipment that they manufacture what is sold to the public. The production lots are subject to stringent manufacturing requirements. They uh, are subject to documentation requirements and quality control checks. Are R&D batches made under more carefully controlled conditions than, say, generally uh, manufacturing production <laughs> batches are? At Quad, no, sir. The R&D batches are, are much less stringently controlled than the production batches. Very good. Mr. Boucher, how did Quad uh, characterize the batches it was providing to FDA? They had a variety of ways um, of characterizing these, some of which actually disclosed the fact that R&D facilities and procedures were used. Occasionally in the uh, narratives or buried in the fine print of supporting documents, Quad submissions, ANDAs, did indicate or imply that R&D batches were being submitted. Other times, Quad frequently used phrases, uh, quote, production-like, close quote, or, quote, production lots made on production equipment in our sterile production areas, close quote, or, quote, pilot production, close quote, or, quote, full-scale production batch, close quote. So this ambiguous language that you have described uh, was used, and did the generic drug division chemists ever check up on these ambiguities? Yes, sir. Um, sometimes deficiency letters were sent to Quad asking for clarification. Um, what Quad sent back to FDA were either carefully worded responses that did not disclose the R&D origin, uh, responses that restated the question without really responding, or simply failures to respond. Did Quad ever send a production batch in response to a specific request from the agency's generic drug division? Yes, sir. They showed me one example where they did and another example where they almost did. What, a, what exactly does almost uh, mean in a situation like this? Well, on at least one occasion, Quad provided material that had been made in its production facility, but not by production personnel or under normal production procedures, including the record keeping. 
Of course, good manufacturing practices is the whole point of the exercise, and they weren't followed for that batch. As time uh, went on, did more questions uh, arise with this company? Yes, sir. Um, according to the records, uh, the generic drug division began to have questions about the sterility of the batches that were tested and submitted. And how did res uh, Quad respond to this? Um, in 1988, uh, Quad built what it called a, uh, quote, clean room, close quote, in the R&D facility. Uh, Quad then called it a, quote, sterile production facility, close quote, which it was not. What was this, uh, quote, uh, clean room in, uh, you've described? It's a, an area, a room in the research and development facility, and it's designed to limit the growth and access of bacteria. It was done in a slipshod manner and does not meet minimum standards. This is not common to have one of these? Well, in, in R&D, um, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Um, food and drug inspectors don't usually have the authority to uh, look at research and development facilities. Our inspectional authority is, is usually limited to areas used for the production of drugs commercially. In this case, we had access to the R&D uh, area because Quad had submitted R&D data and uh, samples to Food and Drug. Just so we're clear, have you ever seen one of these uh, clean rooms before in a research and development area? No, but we don't, we don't generally get to look at R&D areas. How did uh, the company uh, explain this uh, clean room? Well, Dr. Shah, the president, admitted that the R&D clean room um, was intended to manufacture these so-called pilot or production lots that they submitted to FDA, um, whether it would be physically as uh, samples or whether it would be uh, data in the NDAs. Uh, he also admitted the clean room had no other purpose. Um, when I asked him specific questions about who authorized the construction of the room and who originated the idea, uh, he refused to answer until they talked to his attorney. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you, and I have no other questions uh, for this time. The gentleman has expired. The chair recognizes now the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Walker. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, continuing uh, along, Mr. Poucher, uh, you looked at several drugs, uh, one being the hormone testosterone, and what did you find uh, there? This ANDA and follow-up correspondence contain several false or misleading statements. Such as? The batch record for one lot from R&D was submitted in response to an FDA request for a batch manufactured using normal size production equipment. On several other occasions, the firm implied that production equipment was being used. Now, can you give us uh, an example of the implication of uh, saying something is is uh, produced on production equipment. Uh, yes, sir. Um, um, there's a note on the bottom of one of the batch records that says, uh, quote, this production batch was manufactured and then transferred to R&D for stability purposes, close quote. Um, all the records show that this lot was made in R&D and never was in the production facility. In addition to that, I interviewed uh, one of the individuals who actually made the batch and was told that it was made in the R&D lab and then sterilized in the microbiology lab, both of which are not production facilities. Okay. Uh, why would you transfer something uh, uh, from production to R&D for stability? What, what kind of stability are we talking well, about there? The, the implication is that it was produced as a normal production lot and then transferred to the R&D department for continued testing to make sure that the product remains uh, potent and within specification over its expiration period. I see. Well, tell, uh, uh, tell the committee uh, what you found with respect to, uh, and you can tell me how to pronounce it, edrophonium chloride? Correct, sir. Um, a similar pattern of misleading or incorrect statements in the ANDA. For example, they submitted a sample and they called it either a, quote, production lot, close quote, or otherwise a, quote, sterile 10 liter production batch, which was manufactured using production equipment, close quote. Um, the lot was an R&D lot, not manufactured on production equipment, not manufactured by production personnel, and not manufactured in the production building. 
The certificate of analysis um, was submitted to FDA for this lot. That certificate was dated September 15, 1988, stating that the lot was sterile. The sterility test was started on September 14th and completed September 21st, six days after the certificate was signed and dated. So not only is the stuff produced under circumstances and the circumstances uh, of production misrepresented, but then uh, in the certificates uh, uh, with regard to sterility, uh, they're just uh, produced after the fact uh, without any, any uh, uh, relationship to uh, what in fact uh, uh, the, the process that was gone through. That's, that's clear from the dates. The, uh the product was signed off as being tested as sterile six days before the test was even finished. And what does the company come back with? They claim that uh, these uh, quotes that you've given us are merely what? Loose language is, is their explanation. Um, what, we, uh, what we found is that doesn't necessarily cover all the bases. Um, you may be able to explain some of the correspondence as, as loose language, but there's a pattern found that, uh, that you can't explain as, as just being accidental or loose. And those words have very specific meaning to the ears of an FDA reviewer. Production equipment or production-like equipment means that you're doing it on production equipment, does that's, it not? That's what it would mean to me, sir. I would consider production equipment to be that found in the production area. Uh, either the same brand or at least the same size, the same, the same type of equipment. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, turning to, uh, uh, and do you say it, e ethacrinate sodium? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, what's that uh, That's a, a diuretic. It can be used for treatment of edema, uh, water retention that's associated with uh, congestive heart failure or cirrhosis of the liver and other conditions, um, including pediatric patients that have congenital heart diseases. So we're not just playing around with uh, uh, superficial acne or uh, uh, something that doesn't matter. No, sir. When you talk about congestive heart failure, cirrhosis of the liver, um, serious childhood disease, you better deliver the, 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 the performance that uh, uh, is represented. Yes, sir and expected. Uh, was this the drug that led to the inspection of November and December at... Uh, yes, sir. This was the one that had the weight variation problem. Um, uh, our laboratory is trying to validate the, the drug process and found this weight non-uniformity. And the cause of that failure was, the, was Quad's failure to follow the production procedures for the drug. So your laboratory in weighing found non-uniformity. Correct. And you were able to, um, uh, to uh, infer from that to the production <coughs> variations. Yes, sir. They didn't, they didn't follow the exact procedure that they should have followed on the drug. A quad had supplied these procedures to the FDA. How did you know what procedures they? <coughs> yes, sir. Twice. They're, they are specified in a master record by which all batches are supposed to be produced and also in a batch record that is the record of the production of that specific batch. And Quad had told the FDA that that particular sample had been manufactured in accordance with the master record and that batch record. Yes, sir, um, especially the batch record because it's a record of every significant step performed in manufacturing a drug. Was Quad's representation true in your opinion? No, sir. If Quad had followed the exact batch record, then the sample would have passed the tests. Um, what other irregularities uh, developed uh, and came to your uh, awareness in this process? Um, missing documents uh, were found. In November 1988, Quad had made additions to a batch record that had previously been submitted and uh, 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 FDA deficiency letter was issued asking for uh, that missing information. And uh, in their submission, it claimed that the data that was added to the record was taken from the chemist's notebook. And two weeks after that submission, I went to Quad and asked the company for the data, and the company could not supply the data in the original notebooks, and they have not to this day. 
Um, they have not produced any other source for the data that was added to the batch record. Any other regularities in the batch records? Uh, yes, sir. One batch record uh, provided was a mixture of uh, original pages, photocopied pages, and pages with uh, original signatures on photocopies. And is that, uh, is that unusual? It's, it's extremely unusual. Um, batch records are uh, sacrosanct. They are uh, uh, extremely important. And uh, it's strange beyond explanation to have a mixed original and a photocopy in a batch record. Uh, the list goes on. Any other irregularities in the batch record? Yes, it turned out that on that batch record, an R&D manager had signed his initials that he had performed or checked certain operations in the manufacture of the batch. And he told me that he, in fact, did not perform or check those operations. Um, any other problems? Yes, it could go on for a while. Uh, to sum it up, there were numerous instances where uh, documents for other lots that were submitted to FDA had discrepancies, and the document showed that numerous manufacturing shortcuts had been, had been taken. Uh, and when you see a list going on and on and on like that, uh, what does that um, leave you feeling with respect to other drugs manufactured by Quad? Uh, that would make me suspicious, sir. Um, in fact, uh, the investigation into Quad is ongoing right now. So you don't, we say in Pennsylvania, we didn't fall off the turnip truck yesterday, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. <laughs> Gentlemen. Gentlemen from Oregon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dorio, let me ask you some questions about Viterine's uh, New York uh, facility. Now, how long have you been with the agency and in what capacity uh, have you served? Uh, for 15 years, uh, 13 years as an investigator after two years in the laboratory. And you did the uh, Viterine uh, inspection of the New York uh, facilities? Uh, yes, that's right. On uh, May 1st through June 14th and a second phase on July 31st through August 30th. And how did the inspection of Viterine in, uh, in New York come about? Uh, that inspection was actually an offshoot of an inspection of uh, Viterine's uh, facility in St. Croix, Virgin Islands. Uh, that inspection uh, developed evidence of discrepancies between plant production records versus production records submitted to the FDA in any NDAs. Could you uh, briefly summarize the results of that uh, investigation? Uh, our inspection covered over 30 different approved ANDA products. We found numerous instances of overstating batch sizes, of missing documents, of missing product, and discrepancies between company records and records submitted to the FDA. And what did the management of Viterine do when they had evidence of a potentially major problem? On May 3rd, uh, the company informed the uh, Food and Drug Administration that they would suspend distribution of all 25 products for which ANDAs had been approved since 1986. Uh, the company later recalled 12 of those products, and to my knowledge, distribution remained suspended. Did Viterine's management uh, disclose uh, to you instances where substitution took place? Uh, yes, for on five cases. Uh, the first, uh, generic diazide, that's a product that uh, was being marketed by Viterine. And the other four are verapamil, sustained release tablets, albutyl sulfate, sustained release tablets, propranolone, long acting capsules, and methylprednisolone tablets. What did they tell you about the generic uh, diazide? Uh, sometime in uh, late June, uh, they said that their, the Viterine's vice president of quality control uh, visited the uh, laboratory that would be doing the bioequivalence uh, testing for that product. And uh, upon examination of the product, uh, the visual review of the color and granulation of the material in the Viterine capsule indicated that it was not the Viterine material. Uh, I believe they subsequently uh, suspected that it might be Smith-Klein's material. 
Let me ask you about these uh, other four drugs, if I, I could as well. Uh, tell me, if you would, about the hypertension uh, drug. That's verapamil, isn't it? Verapamil, that's yes. right. On June 14th, during our inspection, uh, Dr. Seymour Hyden, uh, Executive Vice President at uh, Viterine, informed me that they had evidence of a switch involving verapamil. The Viterine tablets returned from BioDecision Laboratories in Pittsburgh, that's the firm who did the bioequivalence work, contained innervator material. Uh, tell me about the, the bronchial drug, and if you would, identify that one for the record as well. Albuterol sulfate sustained release tablets. On the same day, June 14th, Dr. Hyden indicated based on his discussions with uh, Steve Colton, uh, the firm's former uh, vice president of research and development, that there may be similar problems of substitution with albuterol for which an application had been submitted to the FDA. What about the uh, hypertension drug? Uh, propranolol long-acting capsules. Again, on June 14th, Dr. Hyden indicated, based on his discussions with Dr. Steve Colton, that possible switch problems exist here as well. This application had not been submitted to the FDA. And finally, what about the uh, anti-inflammatory drug? Uh, methylprednisolone tablets. On July 29th, uh, my co-investigator uh, was at the firm and uh, Dr. Hyden showed him uh, methylprednisolone tablets uh, which were sent to BioDecision by, uh, by Viterine and it was not the Viterine's product based on appearance. And what has uh, been done to follow up on this? Uh, FDA field investigators have collected samples of all Viterine products at both pharmacokinetics and biodecision laboratories as well as at the Viterine plant itself. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I have no further questions. Time of the gentleman has expired. Gentleman from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and would like to continue and uh, for the uh, purpose of completing this record. Mr. Dario, uh, you mentioned discrepancies concerning batch sizes reported to the FDA by Viterine. Uh, can you describe those discrepancies in the batch sizes to the subcommittee? In at least a dozen different uh, ANDAs that we investigated, our investigation showed that there had not been enough raw material on hand to make the reported batch sizes, nor was there the expected amount of finished tablets or capsules left over. Uh, is the reporting of the batch size important? What's that? Uh, My understanding is that uh, generic drug division considers batch size an important issue in ANDA review. And as touched on earlier, it has to do with uh, uh, the assurance of uh, averages and potency and the like. That's correct. Uh, can you describe how you determined that the raw materials uh, had not been enough of them, had been insufficient uh, on hand to make the, the batch size that was claimed? Uh, we examined the batch production records and the usages of the raw material indicated on those batch production records versus shipping and receiving records such as invoices. Uh, inventory records, raw material inventory records would have been checked, but for the most cases they were missing. And, and, and then how do you put that together? How do you use the uh, uh, shipping records? What we did during the inspection was to reconstruct amounts of raw material off invoices and receiving records and uh, that showed less raw material uh, product was available than needed to make the amounts claimed on the batch production records. Uh, how do you put that together with information on finished tablets or numbers of finished tablets? Uh, all, all batch records include a, uh, a yield record which is uh, uh, a document that shows a number of tablets or capsules produced for that batch. Uh, the amount of product left over at the plant should be uh, close, close to the theoretical yield and as indicated on the actual yield. Because research and development batches are, are generally not shipped, uh, one would expect to find the product on hand at the plant. Here in most cases, less than half the expected amount was accounted for. 
So when you put the two and two together, you have a pretty strong circumstantial case. Uh, yes. It's sort of like playing Clue in a way, isn't it, where you, you infer from the, whether or not the pipe and the wrench are there that the, the, uh, what's in the unknown uh, 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 room. Uh, now, was this confirmed in any other way? It, it was confirmed through another piece of evidence, and that was research uh, notebooks, which were kept uh, by a subordinate of uh, Dr. Steve Colton. Uh, the research notebooks generally reported a smaller batch size than what was reported on the batch records, and that that smaller batch size was consistent with the raw material available. Okay. Uh, what's the company's reaction? Have they contested that, uh, uh, that analysis? During our discussions and ins of inspectional observations, there was uh, no major counter-argument. What does the top management of the company uh, tell you? Uh, both both uh, Dr. Hyden and Roger Jordan, the president of the company, said that the first time they learned of these products was during the St. Croix inspection, and that they subsequently questioned uh, Dr. Steve Colton, who ran the research and development uh, uh, department. And was there any uh, uh, offer of explanations for the overstatements in the batch size? Only that the Vice President of Research and Development, Steve Colton, had not been producing the batches as, as set forth on the batch records and that this was unknown to uh, Roger Jordan and Seymour Hyden. I see. Mr. Dario, you mentioned document problems. Can you review for the subcommittee the kinds of records related irregularities that you uncovered here? First, in many cases, uh, the firm lacked the original batch records. All we had to work with during this investigation was copies from the ANDAs in many instances. Why is the original batch record uh, critical? Well, in one, in one case where we had an original batch record, this was for generic diazide, the actual capsule yield reported on the front of the document differed from what we believe to be the actual yield which was written on the back of the document. The ANDA submission only included the front of the document. What other kinds of problems uh, arise here? Uh, the next type of problems was missing raw material inventory and usage cards. Those are uh, critical uh, backup for batch production records and are required by good manufacturing practices. Uh, do you have evidence that uh, these kinds of documents were destroyed? I was told by uh, Dr. Hyden and Gail Prince, Vice President of Regulatory Affairs, that they believe that uh, Dr. Steve Colton may have destroyed records. They had each been informed by a subordinate that he had been, that he had been instructed by Dr. Colton to destroy records which he had carried out. Also during our inspection of the Research and Development Department, we found torn up records in the trash batch records and inventory records. Were those batch records that were in the trash? There was, there was batch records in the trash and some raw material inventory records in the trash, yes. And good manufacturing practice would also have created destruction records, would it not? Uh, that's right. Any, pr any product to be uh, destroyed, you, would, you must keep uh, product destruction records. And, uh, and generally, what? these are missing at uh, Viterine. Do you have evidence of forged documents in this New York uh, facility? Uh, one individual has told us that uh, initials purported to be his were in fact not his. That was on a batch record. Uh, most of the batch records have initials identified, which were identified to me, as those of Dr. Colton and a subordinate, Tib Nawako. Dr. Colton and Mr. Nawako were not available for interviews since they were, uh, uh, according to uh, Roger Jordan and Dr. Hyden, was, were pl was placed on leave by the company. So you've, you've got these major record keeping problems throughout the research and development operation. If you had the kinds of uh, accurate records that uh, would have been uh, called for uh, in these instances, uh, uh, does their lack really put you uh, in a terrible position uh, and hinder an investigation like this? Uh, yes, yes, and in most, in most cases because of the documentation, I don't, I don't think uh, 
we'll ever be able to tell what the true batch size is for many of these products. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could the, company, could the company be sure of the true batch size from these records? I, I don't think so. I, uh, the company was conducting investigations simultaneous with us, and I don't, I don't think they came down to a definitive answer in terms of tablet or capsule yield. Yeah. Thank you. The uh, gentleman from Oregon? Yeah, that's it. Gentlemen, the uh, committee expresses our particular thanks to you for your invaluable assistance to the committee in discussing the matters under which the committee is inquiring. We uh, may call upon you for additional assistance at some time in the future, but uh, you have certainly been a valuable and, and significant help to the committee in our inquiries today. And we are to each of you very deeply grateful, and we express to each of you our thanks and also our commendations, gentlemen. It is a comfort to see that uh, public servants of your quality are working on these matters. Thank you. You uh, may be excused. We may be recalling you at some time in the future, but for now, uh, you go with the thanks of the committee. Thank you, gentlemen. While the uh, panel is being changed, the chair has several notations for the record that I would like to make at this particular time. Before the uh, chair calls the next panel, the chair notes that Mr. Perry Levine, the president of PAR, was subpoenaed to appear today. The chair and the staff of the committee have been advised that uh, Mr. Levine claims to be too sick to appear today. For that reason, the chair will defer requiring the appearance of Mr. Levine today. The chair does note that Mr. Levine is under subpoena, does remain under subpoena, and is not excused from his responsibilities to comply with the subpoena of this committee at the time of the choosing of the committee. We. Uh, will therefore not require his presence today, even though he remains under the process of this committee. The chair notes that we are having him examined independently to test the claim as to his health and to ascertain whether in fact he is sufficiently well to appear here when he is not sufficiently well to, to rather when he is sufficiently well apparently to participate actively in the affairs of the corporation. It is important to note that while his doctors claim that his appearance today might produce dangerous stress, Mr. Levine's physical condition did not prevent him from traveling personally to Washington on July 17, 1989, to personally assure the staff of this committee that only two apples would be presided, rather would be found in the barrel over which he had presided over the past 10 years, which were in fact bad apples. He did not make the trip four days later when his lawyers requested a meeting to correct material misrepresentation made by Mr. Levine and by his son Jeffrey Levine on July 17. The chair now will call Mr. Jeffrey M. Levine, Mr. R. K. Patel, Mr. Ashok Patel, Mr. J. B. Patel, and Mr. Barry Geller all of whom are now employees or officers of Parr Pharmaceutical Incorporated of Spring Valley, New York. The chair also calls Mr. Dilip Shah and Mr. Jan Sturm of Quad Pharmaceuticals of Indianapolis, Indiana. Quad is, as the records of this committee indicate, a wholly owned subsidiary of Parr. Each of these individuals, the chair notes, have been duly served with a subpoena. And without objection, copies of those subpoenas will be inserted into the record at the appropriate place. Gentlemen, will you come forward, please? <laughs> Have they got the name tags for them? For them? Are you putting them out? Mm -hmm. Is 
Patrick going to come forward? No? Should we ask if you want to come forward? Gentlemen, uh, the chair notes we have a number of persons appearing here under the subpoena of the committee at the table. The chair notes we also have a number of members of the bar who are representing them. The chair advises that um, for these reasons, the chair is going to request that each of our witnesses who appear here under the subpoena of the committee identify themselves first. We will then proceed to have the attorneys representing the individuals to identify themselves and to, identi and, and to uh, state the number or the identity of the persons whom they will be representing today. The chair will, of course, have of uh, a brief, I suspect, colloquy with a number of people relative to the fashion in which they will appear at the committee today and give testimony on the matter. Gentlemen, some preliminary discussions first. It is the practice of the subcommittee that all witnesses appearing before this committee are required to appear under oath. Gentlemen, do you or any of you object to appearing under oath today. The record will indicate that there is no objection stated to the witnesses appearing. Gentlemen, each of you has the right to be represented by counsel during your appearance today. Uh, the chair is now going to ask you, starting I think probably on the right and going across rather on, on your left and my right, and going across to your right and my left to identify the names of those gentlemen who are appearing here under subpoena of the committee. Gentlemen, would you, would you proceed, please? You are? My name is Jan Sturm, former Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at Quad Pharmaceuticals. Very well. And you, sir? Dilip Shah. Very well. And? <coughs> I'm Very well. Jeffrey M. Levine, Executive Vice President, Bar Thank Pharmaceutical. You. Thank you, Mr. Levine. Uh, Jayant B. Patel, former Quality Assurance Manager of Bar Pharmaceutical. Very well. Now, gentlemen, as the chair of notes that Mr. R. K. Patel was also to be here today. Is uh, Mr. Where's he? Dingle, my name is. Tom Puccio, I represent Mr. Patel. He is here, but under your rules, I would request that he, on his behalf, the cameras and uh, well, that will be that will be done in conformity with the rules. Please ask your client to come forward so that he is in compliance with the subpoena. The question of when the cam cameras will be turned off is a matter which will be decided by the chair under the rules of the house. Well, so you will please, Ms. Puccio. You have certain rights, and that is to advise your client. I, I don't wish to instruct a member of the bar. However, if that is necessary, the chair will proceed in that course. The chair is going to inform you that uh, your client will, will now come forward and respond. The committee will the commit to, to the subpoena. Uh, that would, and, and his failure to do that might trigger a very unfortunate situation that neither you nor I want. Well, I, you. You, if you, I may you, just put on the record, sir. That you may put anything you want on the record, but your, your, your client is here to testify and not you. So you will instruct your client at this time to please come forward. Well, can I at least put on the record? No, you may not put on the record. You, you are here for the sole and exclusive purpose of advising your client and not putting matters on the record. Please instruct your client to come forward so that we uh, avoid the well, unpleasant necessity of uh, dealing with this as a failure to comply with the process of the committee. Well, I just want to Thank know. you. At the appropriate time, sir, you will be recognized for whatever it is that is appropriate for you to say. At this time, you're intruding into the business of the committee. Now, gentlemen, 
Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Patel, you, uh, do you desire to, rather, do you object to appearing here under oath? No. No, very well. Now, uh, the uh, chair will start again on your left, gentlemen, and inquire. Uh, would, would each of our witnesses today please identify for the record the attorneys who will be representing them? Please, sir. Bill Murphy. Very well. William Taylor. Very well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jed Rakoff. Thank you. Mr. Patel. Mr. Who, who will be your attorney who will be representing you today? Tom Pusio. Very well. Mr. Patel. Ms. Wilson. Very well. Now, uh, Mr. Geller, are you represented by counsel? Very well. Now, gentlemen, the chair will advise you again that um, the committee will respect fully the rights of all persons who appear before this committee uh, with regard to their, their uh, rights to be represented by and advised by counsel during their appearance here. Now, um, gentlemen, the uh, chair notes for the record that copies of the rules of the committee, the rules of the subcommittee, and the rules are the, of the House itself are in the green and red books before you at the table. They are there for your information, and they are there to advise you of your rights, and also upon the limitations of the powers of the committee. Gentlemen, uh, if you will please each now rise and raise your right hand. That is, those gentlemen amongst you who are here to give testimony. Would you raise your hand? Gentlemen, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Gentlemen, the chair notes that you are each under oath, and the chair now inquires do any of you have, uh, well, let's, let's just commence here. Uh, this first question will be to Dr. Dilip Shah. Um, you are the former president of Quad Pharmaceuticals, and I believe you are appearing here, Dr. Shah, pursuant to the subpoena of the committee. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That is correct. Very well. Dr. Shah, the committee at this time will recognize you for any statement that you have and for any requests that you may wish to assert to the committee. I respectfully request under Rule 113F2 of the Rules of the House of Representatives that all camera lenses be covered and all microphones be turned off. Very well. Uh, the same question now to um, the same question now to no, 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 we'll do the whole thing. The same question now goes to Mr. Ashok Patel. Mr. Patel, do you have a statement or do you have a request of the committee? Yes, sir. I respectfully request that I be afforded the privilege of the 11.3 F2 regarding the photography and photography. Very well. Mr. Geller. Same. No question. Very well. Mr. Levine. No request. No response. Uh, and now, Mr. Patel, do you have a statement or a request to the committee? We have the same request. Beg pardon? We have the same request. The same request. Now, the Could chair, the chair Mr. Puccio, for your assistance, it is Mr. Patel from whom the committee wishes to hear. Your function, so that we understand each other clearly, is to advise him during his appearance here. Your function is not to speak on his behalf. The question is directed, the chair advises you, to Mr. Patel. Mr. Patel, do you have a statement that you wish to make to the committee, or do you have a request that you wish to make to the committee? We have the same request. You make the same request. Very good. 
Mr. J. Patel, do you have a statement or do you have a request to the committee that you wish to make at this time? I'm sorry. Very well. Gentlemen, the chair recognizes. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. The chair chair ignored Mr. Sturm. Uh, Mr. Same Sturm, request. do you have a question or or or, I have the or same request? request same request. The camera. Mike. Chair apologizes. I didn't mean to miss you. Uh, gentlemen, the chair advises that you have set forth an absolute right under the under the rules of the House of Representatives. The chair therefore responds by instructing that all television cameras be turned off at this time. The chair also instructs that all microphones will be shut off except those used in the internal conduct of the bus business of this committee. And that microphones relative to uh, purposes other than public address will at this time be shut off. The chair also instructs that the lenses on the cameras in the room shall be capped. And the chair advises that this instruction applies to not only the uh, television cameras, but also still cameras, and also to all recording devices. Um, were there further requests of our witnesses? Okay. Gentlemen, uh, uh, Mr. With, Chairman, uh, appropriate regret, Chair has to ask you that the cameras do be turned off, be capped, uh, they have the lenses capped. Beg pardon? Uh, as long as they're as long as they're pointed down, the the, the chairs the chair because of the, of the character of the rules has to insist that they be enforced as uh, fully as they can. And uh, so, if you will please point them down, see to it that they're that they're turned away. Um, that applies to C-SPAN too. I have participated in and contributed to the growth of PAR into one of the leading manufacturers of low-cost generic drugs. <clears throat> Throughout my employment of PAR, I have tried to conduct my department and myself with integrity and with concern for FDA standards. Along the way, I have made some mistakes, but I have tried to correct those mistakes and do the right thing. I believe others at PAR did the same. Consequently, I was stunned when approximately two months ago, I saw a senior officer of the company replace tablets containing triamterine and hydrochlorothiazide that were used in a bioavailability study with tablets that were recently manufactured and caused the replacement tablets to be given to FDA. I regret that I, did not that I did not take sufficient action to prevent this from occurring. I always question myself for this. I did inform company counsel of what happened and cooperated with the FDA. Mm -hmm. United States. And thank you. So it is necessary for us all to get close to these microphones. I did inform company counsel of what had happened and cooperated with the officials in the subcommittee in conducting an open investigation. I am currently working with various outside consultants to, with Tupar and with FDA. We have learned of other practices that should not have occurred. Our investigation continues and various corrective actions have already been taken. The events of the last two months have been difficult and painful, but I have learned from them and so has PA. I hope that with the help of many dedicated employees at PA, we can rebuild a company that we as employees and the public can be proud of. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would give it this time? Yes, thank you. you Maybe consider yourself recognized. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I welcome the opportunity to appear before you and discuss recent problems regarding PAR Pharmaceutical Inc. and Quad Pharmaceuticals Inc. As you know, I submitted a prepared written statement last Friday. I would request that it be printed in full as part of my testimony before this subcommittee. Additionally, I would like to take a few moments now to summarize some of the highlights of that statement. Without, without objection, this means the full statement will be placed in the record and you recognize the summary as you wish. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At the outset, it may be helpful for the subcommittee to know something about the background of Parr, Quad, and myself. PAR was founded just over 10 years ago and went public in 1983. Our philosophy has been to put profits back into new product filings and expansion. As a result, 
far now produces over 100 drugs and may have the broadest product line of any U.S. Drug generic drug manufacturer. We believe far success over the last decade is attributable to the quality of our products and the service we provide our customers. Society. In brief, we at PAR have tried to conduct ourselves as responsible corporate citizens. Quad is a producer of injectable pharmaceuticals. It has always been run by persons not originally associated with PAR. While PAR now has a 60% equity interest in Quad, Quad fully controls its own daily operation, with PAR only having authority over legal and various financial matters. As for myself, after graduating from college in 1977, I worked as a CPA with two firms, the most recent being Pete Marwick. In 1981, I began at PAR, joining my father, Perry, one of the company's founders. Like my father, I have no scientific background, and thus I have worked exclusively on the business side of the company. Presently, I occupy the position of the Executive Vice President with responsibilities for sales and marketing. There is no denying the fact that Par and Quad on several occasions, myself on one occasion, made some serious mistakes. We accept responsibility for those mistakes, are making substantial efforts to make certain they never recur, and hope to satisfy you and the public that they have in no way compromised the safety quality of our products, or our commitment to maintain the highest standards. But to understand why these mistakes occurred, it is important for you to know that, until recently, the three internal divisions of PAR, sales and business, R&D and production, regulatory affairs and laboratory, were essentially autonomous. In addition, the day-to-day -day operation of QUAD was essentially autonomous from PAR. As a result, there was less intra-company supervision than, in hindsight, might have been required to prevent the serious mistakes that occurred. The nature of those mistakes are detailed in my prepared statement, and I'm here today to try to answer any questions you may have regarding them to the extent that they are within my knowledge. But without for a moment condoning those mistakes, I think it only fair to add that no evidence has been presented that such misconduct has occurred ever compromised the safety or efficacy of our products nor that product applications received any special preference. In addition, PAR has taken strong steps to prevent any future recurrence of misconduct and to further ensure the quality of our products and the honesty of our employees. Thus, we have retained well-known independent outside consultants to investigate PAR submissions to the FDA, and we, have, and we have them made accountable to our outside directors. A scientific consulting firm and a respected former senior compliance official of the FDA are conducting that investigation. Further, PAR voluntarily suspended shipments of all of its solid dosage products pending internal reviews. And the results are now being shipped, and, and the products are now being shipped only after being re-verified. Quality assurance people have been added at each production step. Our employees are on notice that any question as to regulatory compliance should be immediately presented to counsel, and that miscon misconduct will be met with swift action. To protect against the possibility of any improper expenditures, our expense review procedures have been strengthened. We are vigorously monitoring adherence to all of these preventive measures. Finally, I think an objective appraisal will confirm that we have cooperated with, very fully with the FDA, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and the staff of this subcommittee in the investigation of activities of PAR and QUAD. In this respect, I would be pleased to respond to any question you may have regarding the allegation that, at a meeting with the subcommittee staff on July 17, I failed to bring to light the one incident of this conduct of which I had personal knowledge. In brief summary, the facts are that on the afternoon of July 6, I was briefly informed by a more senior company official that during a recent FDA inspection, he had su substituted a sample from one batch of PAR product for a sample from another batch of the same product made by PAR. In other words, this is not a case of substituting a brand product for our own. I went to speak with PAR's Vice President of Regulatory Affairs, Mr. Geller here, to find out what happened and why. I told Mr. Geller that we needed to closely question the official who had made that disclosure to me to find out more specifically what had happened so that we could report the incident to counsel. But when I attempted to do so, I learned that the official had left the office for a week-long trip to the West Coast. Before rushing to judgment, I felt we needed to talk with him personally, both in order to figure out what had happened and also so that we could properly proceed with disclosure of the incident. Under all circumstances, I probably should have proceeded more quickly with an in-house investigation and made a quicker disclosure of the apparent facts, however incomplete, to the FDA, 
and the subcommittee, something that was not done for two weeks. Although I do not believe I ever affirmatively misled the subcommittee staff in any respect, I probably should have volunteered even my limited knowledge of this incident at our meeting on July 17. And I deeply regret any misimpression that I might have unintentionally created thereby. However, I believe it only fair to point out that the company, with my complete support, ultimately brought the full facts to the attention of the subcommittee within a matter of days, and moreover, began putting preventive systems in place to prevent any future recurrence. Furthermore, while all the facts remain, while all the facts regarding the underlying incident are not yet known, we have no reason to believe this episode affected the quality of the product. Nonetheless, on July 19, we voluntarily stopped shipments pending an investigation. The senior official of PAR involved in the apparent incident was placed on leave pending investigation and has su subsequently resigned. Chairman Dingle, you have said that a heavy economic price should be paid by firms that have engaged in misconduct. We believe that we are paying a heavy price now and will continue to do so in the future. PAR and Quad will be sentenced for the illegal gratuities paid by one official at each company, even though we have been told by the U.S. Attorney that one, there was no evidence that anyone else at Par and Quad had knowledge of the misconduct. And two, that it was an FDA chemist who initiated the misconduct. Par has laid off approximately 150 employees and its most recent financial statements reported a loss, the first since our early history. A petition is pending at the FDA for withdrawal of all product approvals over a period of several years. Class actions and a shareholder derivative suit have been brought. You can also be assured that we will have and will continue to suffer great losses in the marketplace. We hope that after considering these facts, you will conclude that the violations are being punished more than adequately. This has obviously been a most difficult period, but we understand that to remedy the recent problems and the underlying circumstances, it must be so. Further, only through the openness of proceedings such as this hearing can we help assure the public that confidence and parse integrity is warranted. Accordingly, I would welcome at this time the opportunity to answer any questions that you, Mr. Chairman, and the members of the subcommittee may have. Gentleman from Oregon for questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Some questions for you, Mr. Geller. You are appearing today, as I understand it, pursuant to the subpoena of the subcommittee, aren't you? That's correct. And it's also my understanding that you've been cooperating uh, with the subcommittee in its investigation, have you not? Yes, I have. Now, the subcommittee is very appreciative of this uh, cooperation. And it's worth noting, uh, particularly to your employers, that Chairman Dingle and the members of the subcommittee take a very dim view of retaliation against those who cooperate uh, with the business of the uh, subcommittee. Now, Mr. Geller, as the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for PAR, you were involved with the FDA inspection of PAR that began in May, were you not? Yes, indirectly. On July 6, 1989, did you take a sample of PAR's generic Maxide to R.K. Patel's office at his request? Yes, I did. You report to Mr. R.K. Patel, is that correct? No, I don't. Who do you report? I used to, to report to Mr. Ashik Patel. Uh, he left the company. On paper, I report to Mr. Perry Levine. Uh, Mr. Jeffrey Levine was running the company. In effect, I reported to Jeff Levine. You gave the sample of generic Maxide uh, to Mr. Patel as he left Jeff Levine's office? He left the office, and he asked me to get him the sample, and I went to his office with him. I gave it to him in there. Then Mr. R.K. Patel and you went into his office where he proceeded to substitute the contents of another bottle for the material that you originally gave him? That's correct. Did Mr. R.K. Patel give you any indication of why he was putting in different material? I asked him what the problem was, and he said sodium bicarbonate. Everybody knows that. And I didn't know what he meant. But he gave no further explanation. You didn't understand what he meant, and did you say anything to him? When I saw him switch the samples, I said, I don't think you ought to do that. It's not right. 
Did you say that you didn't think anyone in regulatory yes. affairs knew about yes, this as I well? And I'm not sure I heard correctly yes. on this point. Did you tell Mr. Patel that you didn't think he should do uh, what he had done? That's correct. And then you left his office? Yes, the door had been closed. He opened it, I could, indicating that I should leave. After that, the FDA investigator also asked for stability samples for generic Maxide? That's correct. And you informed R.K. Patel of, uh, of the request? Yes. What did, uh, Mr. Patel's, what did Mr. Patel say? He said, let me check with the lab. Did uh, R.K. Patel report on his findings uh, there? Yes, he said something to the effect, everything is okay. It was switched some time ago or a long time ago. I don't remember his exact words. Uh, Mr. Geller, did you discuss some of these uh, particular events with Jeff Levine the same day? Yes, I did. Did Mr. Levine inform you that R.K. Patel had told him what Mr. Patel had done with the generic Maxide? Yes. Did Mr. Levine tell you that he should keep the that you should keep the information to yourself and that he would discuss it with R.K. Patel? I believe he said we would discuss it. He said it would be discussed with Mr. Patel. <laughs> when the FDA inspector left the next day, did you raise this matter with him? No, I did not. I gather that this was a pretty tough decision. Yes. The matter of R.K. Patel's switch of samples did not come up again until July 18 when you disclosed it to outside counsel for the company? That's correct. At that point, uh, the lawyers essentially took charge of things? Yeah. You were cautioned not to speak with the senior management about the matter? That's correct. But the next morning, there was a meeting with Jeff Levine, Perry Levine, R.K. Patel, and you to discuss the situation prior to those three uh, meeting with counsel in Washington? That's correct. At this meeting, it was the consensus that counsel would be told of the meeting? Yes, they were going down to Washington to speak to counsel. Uh, when they left, they agreed they would tell counsel about the meeting. But then later that particular morning, you got a call from Jeff Levine saying that the conversation that morning never took place? That's correct. And you had subsequent discussions with Jeff Levine regarding your conversation with him on July 6th? Um, in the, that evening when they returned. He was saying that he had used the word investigate in connection with the RK switch, yes. but you did not recall that? I didn't recall him saying it, and I didn't recall him not saying it. Mr. Geller, as you know, the subcommittee uh, this morning heard uh, disturbing information concerning manufacturing and record keeping practices at PAR. These included deviations from uh, the abbreviated new drug uh, applications, reworking of batches, and records alteration or losses. Do you have additional information that you would like to supply the subcommittee at this time concerning those practices? Um, I'd like to explain some of the ones that were discussed before, if that's okay. Please um, proceed. Um, one of them was perfenazine and amitriptyline. Um, the which, which drug is, is that, uh, beyond, the the beyond the technical yeah, name? That was the one um, where he said it was, part of it was manufactured off-site or an unapproved site. And what does the drug do? What kind of drug is it? I'm not sure what it does. When um, we applied for our ANDA for that, uh, we referenced our master file. Our master file says specific, the master file covers our Spring Valley facility and our Congress facility. Um, the master file says specifically that all coding will be done up at Congress. And that's where this was coded. The compression of the tablets and the mixing and the granulation and the weighing was done at Spring Valley. Did you handle the procurement of samples for bioequivalency studies? I sent them out, yes. And how was that done? I would usually ask the laboratory to get me samples of our product. Um, samples of the name brand would be ordered through a drugstore. Did you ever attend a meeting concerning triamterene in which R.K. Patel asked if the old samples had been replaced by the new? No, I don't recall that. Sir. Do you recall any discussions prior to July 6th of substitutions of samples? No. In general, were you aware of problems which arose in the laboratory? Um, 
day-to-day -day problems, yes. Okay. Were you aware of the off-the-record book, which I discussed uh, earlier with FDA officials? I became aware of it approximately a month ago during an investigation. Did J.B. Patel report to you? No, he reported to the Director of Regulatory Affairs who reported to me. Now, were you aware that one of the uh, PAR products, I think it was the uh, acetate, Megesterol acetate tablets had dissolution problems? I was aware that two batches had dissolution problems and they were in quarantine. What did R.K. Patel do about uh, this? Well, so subsequently we had an investigation. Those two, I don't think he did anything. But two other batches, uh, subsequent to an investigation, we found out that he added uh, sodium lauryl sulfate to the tablets. They were ground up um, and recompressed. Did you knew, know about that at the time? Oh, no. This was after. After it was shipped. And with respect to uh, Mr. R.K. Patel, he did not want an investigation? We did our own independent investigation. I believe at that point R.K. wasn't at the company anymore. This was after the Max site switch. And you acquiesced in these decisions? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You have already completed your statement